The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT, Take 12 Radio, or our affiliates. The opinions on this show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice and are those of the host, co-host, and guest. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. One day at a time with its failures and fears With portion of pain and burden of care We must be Welcome to Walking Through the Language of the Heart, a journey into the grapevine writings of Alcoholics Anonymous co-founder, Bill W. And now, here are your co-hosts, Chris S. and the Monty Man. That's right. You got that right. We are back with you this week with another episode with Chris S. on the line. How you doing, Chris? Great, Monty. Great. I hope you had a good week. It's been an excellent week. We are going to talk about one of my favorite topics this week in this article from the book, The Language of the Heart. Where are we, where are we going this week, bud? You know, I've been looking forward to this since we started this, uh, the, this, this podcast, Monty. Uh, this is The Next Frontier Emotional Sobriety. Now, this is probably Bill's most famous essay because it is so powerful. And the article is the substance of a letter that Bill wrote to a close friend who also had troubling depressions. Yeah. And for one reason or another, it was so insightful. But what, what, I, what I also want to do is I want to, I want to uh, express the theory that I have about emotional sobriety. I believe that Bill Wilson understood that we take the steps and we have a spiritual experience but there is a next frontier. There is a next level. We're going to have a exper- uh, spiritual experience, but but our recovery is not going to stop there. There's going to be a whole new, a whole new experience to be had. And I believe Bill Wilson expected Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole to to achieve this. Now, I, now I want to read, I'll do something I, I normally don't do. I want to read the first paragraph from step 12 in the 12 steps and 12 traditions. Okay. So, so, so that was published in 1953 and we read through or in earlier shows, we read through a lot of the earlier drafts of, of uh, him putting this together, but this is what was put into the book in 1953. The joy of living is the theme of AA's 12th step, and action is the key word. Here we turn outward toward our fellow alcoholics who are still in distress. Here we experience the kind of giving that asks no reward. Here we begin to practice all 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us may find emotional sobriety. So this is like 1953 is the first time he's talking about it. And he start, I think, this is my theory. I think he's starting to think that our next frontier, our next challenge, our next experience is going to be emotional sobriety. Mm. And, and here we are, it's January, 1958. And he's writing this letter uh, to a friend who, who is also saying, Bill, I know you have, you know, you suffer from, depression you know what can you tell me about it yeah. and uh, and and this is this is what he's saying so i think that many oldsters who have put our aa booze cure to severe but successful tests still find that they often lack emotional sobriety so i want to i want to stop right there you know what you know what emotional sobriety is really it's not worrying about things that aren't happening 
<laughs> that, yeah. that's what emotion that's what emotional <laughs> sobriety is so so we're you know we're not resentful over something that happened we're, we don't have anxiety about something that's going to happen we're we are you know our our emotional nature is in a healthy state and that's what that's what i believe he's talking about with this emotional sobriety you know let me interject here i just want to say sure. I, I love how dr alan Berger puts this he's you know uh it doesn't mean these things that happen around us or to us don't hurt or they're not uncomfortable or they're not painful. It means they don't knock us off our emotional center of gravity. You know, because so often we hear, well, don't feel that way or that shouldn't hurt that much or whatever. <laughs> well, no, that's not true. But I know for me, when I was emotionally dependent, every little thing knocked me off my center, man. You know what I mean? And when I got knocked off my center, I drank. Yeah, yeah. And th this was in between the drink. How emotionally crippled were we? Yeah, right. Y y and that's really the alcoholism. I believe that's the alcoholism. I believe that's the, the toxic experience of self-consciousness. You know, just always being wrapped up in the drama of self mm -hmm. and, and all the pain that that brings. You know, so he says, perhaps uh, they will be sp they will be the spearhead for the next major development in AA, the development of much more real maturity and balance, which is to say humility in our relations with ourselves, with our fellows and with with God. So he's expecting the next development in Alcoholics Anonymous to be this emotional sobriety. And, I, and I'd like to say in mass, it never happened. So, some of us, some of us that have been in Alcoholics Anonymous and have certainly practiced these 12 steps in all of our affairs have, have achieved some form of uh, emotional sobriety, mm -hmm. but the fellowship itself hasn't. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> just go to a discussion meeting, right, Monty? Right. <laughs> and, and you'll see that that hasn't happened. Those adolescent urges that so many of us have for top approval, perfect security, perfect romance, urges quite appropriate to age 17, proved to be impo an impossible way of life when we were the age of 47 or 57. Hmm. Since AA began, I've taken immense wallops in all these areas because of my failure to grow up emotionally and spiritually. My God, how painful it is to keep demanding the impossible. And how very painful to discover finally that all along we have had the cart before the horse. Then comes the final agony of seeing how awfully wrong we have been, but still finding ourselves unable to get off the emotional merry-go-round. So, so that really puts its finger on so much of what troubles us. We recognize that, that it's unhealthy to be, to be in this emotional state or mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever said this to yourself, but you know, I've said to myself a million times, you know, being sober as long as I am, I should be better than I am now. I, oh, should, sure. be I should be handling this better than I am, you know? Yeah. And, and Bill says we, we find we're unable to get off the emotional merry-go-round, you know? And if you have ever sponsored anybody, uh, which I'm sure you have, Bonnie, right? <laughs> yeah. You, you know, you, you see that quite often, right? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> so how to translate a right mental conviction into a right emotional result and so into easy, happy, and good living? Well, that's not uh, only the neurotics problem. It's the problem of life itself for all of us who've got to the point of real willingness to hew to right principles in all our affairs. That's a powerful uh, powerful paragraph, right mental conviction into emo an emotional result. So many of us figure it out before we experience it. Y y yeah. You know what I mean? L like we'll look at a step or we'll look at a spiritual exercise and mentally, you know, we'll come to terms with it. But, but until we put it into practice, we don't experience it. So, so he's saying, how do you go from knowing that, you know, things could be better to, to things getting better. Even then, as we hew away, peace and joy may still elude us. 
That's the place so many of us AA oldsters have come to. And it's a hell of a spot, literally. How shall our unconscious, from which so many of our fears, compulsions, and phony aspirations still stream, be brought into line with what we actually believe, know, and want? How to convince our dumb, raging, and hidden Mr. Hyde becomes our main task. Hmm. I've recently come to believe that this can be achieved. I believe so because I began to see many beleaguered ones, folks like you and me, commencing to get results. Last autumn, desper- uh, depression, having no real rational cause at all, almost took me to the cleaners. I began to be scared that I was in for another long chronic spell. Considering the grief I've had it with depression, it wasn't a bright prospect. You know, again, uh, there's no way of really proving this, but I believe that there were times when Bill had clinical depression. Um, he, he wasn't really known for taking very good care of himself. Mm-hmm. Not many people were back then, Monty. They, some of them would live on cigarettes and coffee for, you know, weeks yeah. at a time. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, uh, so there might have been some real, real clinical, real, you know, biochemical reason for, uh, for his, his depressions. You know, I, they just didn't have the, the type of, uh, mental, mental health diagnostics that they do today. Sure. I kept asking myself, why can't the 12 steps work to release depression? By the hour, I stared at the St. Francis prayer. It's better to comfort than to be comforted. Here was the formula, all right. But why didn't it work? And many, many times I've asked myself, you know, why aren't I better? Why, you know, I've done all this stuff. Why am I still angry? Or why do I still hmm. wor- worry about things? Why, why do I, why do I still get snippy? Why do I still p- treat people poorly? I think, I think Chris, I think it, you know when he asked the question, here was the formula, all right, but why didn't it work? I think that speaks to our dependency on the method instead of the method giver. You know what I mean? It it goes back to my dependency on the meetings or my dependency on the steps and not the one the steps are pointing me to, that kind of thing. And that's why it isn't working. Absolutely. I believe so much in that. Um, I was at a, a, a treatment center last night, and really the main gist of my talk was, haven't you tried... Haven't you tried getting better? Haven't you tried stopping drinking? Haven't you tried giving up drugs? Haven't you tried becoming a better person? Didn't you know you should? Didn't you really try? <laughs> and and you know what my you know what I was saying was was uh, powerlessness is powerlessness. You know, yeah. it's it, you can't you can't treat the illness with the illness, and the the um, God is going to be the ultimate healer, you know, and this is, this is true in so many cases, like, like picture, picture going into surgery, Monty, a surgeon does not heal you. A surgeon creates an antiseptic environment and removes certain things that aren't good and then sews you up. And you, God heals you. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like, so why, why are we so surprised that emotionally we right. need to have God heal us? Yeah. Yeah. Y- you know what I'm saying? Well, I think, I think because the ego is so tied to the emotions, you know, feelings, feelings, feelings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the, and he says in the beginning of the big book, our problem rests in our mind. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it does. <laughs> so, so, so it says, suddenly I, I realized what the matter was. So he, he came to a revelation here. My basic flaw had always been dependence. You were just saying this. Yes. Almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. Wow. You know, yeah. so 
So being attached to external outcomes, you, you, you know, whether it's praise, whether it's money, whatever, we become emotionally attached to outcomes, certain outcomes that we want, and we fight for them. And, and when it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen, we get depressed. Yeah. Uh, and that, that certainly, certainly makes sense to me. And for the sober alcoholic who says, well, I can't even drink now. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. That can cause a real dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a chance of making uh, the outgoing love of St. Francis a workable and joyous way of life until these fatal and almost absolute dependencies were cut away. So, so realizing that we're attached to outcomes, realizing that we're dependent on uh uh, other people, places, and things for our internal peace of mind, recognizing it is the first step, you know, the, the first, yeah. first step to being, being okay. You, you know, um, I, I, I think I shared this with you before, but I'm, I'm going to share it again. Okay. Uh, my, my friend, Steve from, uh, 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 from Nashville, uh, he shares this about every time he speaks, and it's it's such a great story. So this newcomer uh, goes into a beginners meeting, and he raises his hand. He needs to share, right? <laughs> and man, does he share! He's sharing. Oh, this is terrible! And oh, my parents! Oh, the cops are everything! I got to pay all these fines! Oh, my job! I just got fired from my job! Oh, yeah, I got I'm gonna have no place to live. You know, you guys told me, you guys promised me if I just kept coming, it would get better. If I kept coming, it would get better. Well, I want to know, I want to know when it's going to get better. And so, it, like a good beginner's me, everybody's sharing their own experience. You know, this is, yeah. what, this is what it was like for me, and it took me a while, and it took me a while, right? And then at the end, uh, this wizened old timer raises his hand, you know, and he's the last to share. And this is what he said. He goes, kid, it gets better when it's okay the way it is. <laughs> and that's all he shares, right? And, and everybody's great. like, everybody's like dumbfounded because yeah. there's so much truth in that. There isn't is, there? there is so much wisdom, so much truth. Oh my gosh! Uh, because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development. He 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 always under values and underestimates his his uh, his own his own wisdom. Uh, a, a little spiritual development, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed. Reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I found I had to exert every ounce of will and action to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, indeed upon any set of circumstances whatsoever. Then only could I be free to love as Francis had. Emotional and instinctual satisfactions I saw were really the extra dividends of having love, offering love, and expressing love appropriate to each relation of life. Wow, he, he, he even throws AA in there. I love that. Lots of people need to read this letter because he's saying that he was dependent on the fellowship. Yeah. He was dependent upon Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, and uh, and he's saying he he's saying he re not only does he need to come to the conclusion, but he he needs to work work at a deep understanding that these dependencies are what really is causing him his emotional pain. Now I, now each of us, Monty, I know you've got experiences. I've got experiences. I'll just share one where I had to let go of one of these external things that I, I thought was giving me, you know, so much of what I, my, my esteem needed. Mm -hmm. I had started a home group like in 1997 and for the first couple of years, I, you know, I was the person running it. Right. And, and people were coming far and wide and I was doing a big book study, but I, I understood, I understood that, you know, I had to, I had to follow the principle of rotation. So, so, you know, I had to let go of, you know, being the person in front of the room. Yeah. You know, and then, then about 20 years later, it became time for this meeting to transition. Now this was, you know, internally in my worst 
aspects. It was my meeting. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, sure. It was my meeting. And, you know, and I don't want anybody messing with it. I, I, I need this meeting. People need this meeting. And, and it got to the point where I had to let the meeting die. Hmm. W- without sticking my grubby paws in there to keep it going. I had to, I had mm. to let it, it's time was over. No one needed a workshop in our area anymore. <laughs> you, yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I was able to, I was able to do that and be okay and not have my meeting and just become an AA member in an AA group somewhere. You, yeah. You, yeah. You know what I mean? It, and, it it didn't mean it didn't it it didn't affect you. It it wasn't an emotional thing, it, but it didn't it didn't knock you off. No, I was I didn't get I didn't go into clinical depression. Right, right. Over it. I I I I understood that uh, that it was part of letting go of a dependency. Isn't it you know, like, Isn't it a wonderful thing when you think about it that we can experience some of the things that at one time we thought would do us in and we can experience them now and enjoy the, the truth that they're not doing us in. And, you know, that's yeah. what a gift. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's part of the flow of life. Yeah. And sometimes the flow of life is not going to give you what you, you think you should have, or you think you need. And, you know, it's it's optional to feel horrible about it. Yeah, yeah, is kind of what Bill is saying yeah. here. But but it takes work. It's not it's not something. It's not like you can flip a switch. And, but until and, he realized this, though, he was. It sounds like he was powerless over it. I guarantee he was hanging on to his control of AA up until fifty three, mm-hmm. uh, and and then in in fifty eight, you know, he he understood a lot more about letting go of, and turning things over, and that that you know God really is the 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 ultimate guide of all of this stuff, you know. Uh, I'm sure he went through a, a transition, and for him to kind of document it in this in this essay is very cool. Yeah. Plainly, I could not avail myself of God's love until I was able to offer it back to him by loving others as he would have me. And I couldn't possibly do that so long as I was victimized by false dependencies. For my dependency meant demand, a demand for the possession and control of the people and in the conditions surrounding me. While those words absolute dependency may look like a gimmick, they were the ones that helped to trigger my release into my present degree of stability and quietness of mind, qualities which I am now trying to consolidate by law- offering love to others regardless of the return to me. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's really the secret. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The secret is love. And it's open-handed. It's open-handed. It's without, yep. it's without expectation. Yep. Yep. This seems to be the primary healing circuit, an outgoing love of God's creation and his people, by means of which we avail ourselves of his love for us. It is most clear that the real current can't flow until our paralyzing dependencies are broken, and broken at depth. Only then can we possibly have a glimmer of what adult love really is. Wow. Spiritual calculus, you say? Not, Not a bit of it. Watch any AA of six months working with a new 12-step case. If the case says, to the devil with you, the 12-stepper only smiles and turns to another case. He doesn't feel frustrated or rejected. If his next case responds and uh, in turn starts to give love and attention to other alcoholics, yet gives none back to him, the sponsor is happy about it anyway. He still doesn't feel rejected. Instead, he rejoices that his one-time prospect is sober and happy. And if his next following case turns out in later time to be his best friend or romance, then the sponsor is most joyful. But he well knows that this ha- his happiness is a byproduct, the extra dividend of giving without any demand for a return. You know, I, I had to I had to have this de- dependency broken. Uh, uh, Monty, just after we finished uh, walking through the big book, mm-hmm. uh, the podcast we did in like 
2009. Yeah. Uh, I inherited a house in North Carolina and Andrea and I moved there. And half of my sponsees fired me because I was now an out-of-state sponsor. These were people I'd gotten really, really close to. Wow. And it came as a... It came as a little bit of surprise, but I knew inside that I had to be happy about it. You mm, know, mm-hmm. I had to I had to let go any attachments I had, and certainly they're making the best choice for themselves. They want a sponsor that they can they can interact with on a regular basis. I was moving to North Carolina. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but 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 I felt the pangs of that yeah. uh, that separation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, many of them went on to 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 be well sponsored by somebody else, and for twenty years, you know. You know, I I had a a, a gentleman ask me to be a sponsor, and we barely got going, and he decided to take a left turn and kind of let a higher power and a skirt kind of get in the way, and and that mm-hmm. kind of. Thing. And, and I was like, uh, you know, I, somebody said, aren't you going to go, you know, talk to him about it? And I, I said, we talked, I said, I'm not, I don't chase people down, you know, it's, it's okay. And they go, well, you don't seem like you care. I go, I, I care, but what are you going to do? I'm yeah. here. I'm here. If he decides to come back, I'm here, I'm available, but I'm, I'm not going to pout about it. And it, and it and it got misinterpreted as well. I just wasn't tender hearted towards him. And it was like, no, 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 not at all. I just I can't let that stuff do that. You to were me. you were actually emotionally healthy about it all. Exactly. You, yeah. You know, the really stabilizing thing for him was having and offering love to that strange drunk on his doorstep. That was Francis at work, powerful and practical, minus dependency and minus demand. In the first six months of my own sobriety, I worked hard with many alcoholics. Not a one responded. Yet this work kept me sober. It wasn't a question of those alcoholics giving me anything. My stability came out of trying to give, not out of demanding I receive. Thus, I think it can work out with emotional sobriety. If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependency and its consequent unhealthy demand. Let us, with God's help, continually surrender those hobbling demands. Then we can be set free to live in love. We may be able to do 12-step ourselves and others into emotional sobriety. We may then be able to 12-step ourselves and others into emotional sobriety. You know, this really is an ancient truth. Like, the story of the Buddha. The Buddha came from like a really, really rich family. He had everything he needed, but, but he, you know, he, he knew that he had to figure this thing called life out. He, there, there was, he just, he just needed, he needed an awakening of some kind. So, so he left the, the prestige and everything. And he, you know, he went and tried, tried to become a, a, a religious uh, aesthetic and those things weren't really working for him. And he decided he was going to sit under a Bodhi tree, and he wasn't going to move until he became enlightened. He was not moving until he achieved enlightenment, or, or we would call it spiritual awakening, mm-hmm. okay? And what happened was he came up with the noble truths, and uh, and one of the noble truths is, is basically this. All suffering is because of attachment. So what, what Bill is saying is our suffering is from dependences. It's, it's, al- it's almost the same thing. Mm. So it's, it's a deep spiritual truth. And the thing is that I believe is I believe Bill thought we were all going to get to that realization where we could have total emotional peace of mind mm-hmm. because we would be, we'd be free of all dependencies. The Buddha wanted you to be free of all attachments. Gotcha. You, you, you know? Yeah. Of course, I haven't offered you a really new idea, only a gimmick uh, that has started to unhook several of my own hexes at depth. Nowadays, my brain no longer races compulsively in either elation, grandiosity, or depression. I have been given a quiet place in bright sunshine. 
So, so how about how about that? He's he's talking to somebody who had the same kind of depression problem that he did, and and he's he's saying that you can get to a quiet place, yeah, in bright sunshine. You know, I I, I like the term he uses, unhooked. Um, yeah. You know, the reason this emotional sobriety thing is one of my absolute favorite topics. And I've shared this with you a long time ago, I, I believe, but I'll share it again real quick. Um, there was a time, there was a time in my, well, I'm sure before my active alcoholism, I didn't realize it at the time, certainly during my active alcoholism, when I was so emotionally dependent on, on how on whether you fulfill my expectations of how I felt you should feel about me. Right. Yeah. And, and, and if you did not feel, if I did not interpret your feelings about me the way I wanted them to be, then it would destroy me. And mm -hmm. if you did fulfill my expectation, I would raise the bar and I didn't even know I was doing it. And, and, People would literally, their spirits, if you will, would just close off to me. People did not want to be around me, which just fed depression, right? And I became more demanding in my expectations of people to the point where it was, it was looked upon as Monty was pathetic. I mean, it was really bad. I had no idea how bad until I kind of came out of that fog. And it was mm -hmm. it was during the application and implementation of the 12 steps that that change began to happen. But it was years I lived that way. And I thought, Chris, I really did. I thought everybody was supposed to be that sensitive. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't, it was because you were hard-nosed and too thick-skinned and didn't care. You know, I really believe it. Now I look back at that guy now and I, 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 I recognize him only in people that I've worked with. I ran into a gentleman a couple of years ago at the treatment center that I worked at that th this guy would cry at the drop of a hat. I mean, it was literally it, 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 if you said good morning to him wrong, he was falling apart. And I pulled him aside one day and I, I, I said, you know, I get it. I'm you. I, I was looking in the mirror, man. I was that guy. And I had no idea. Uh, it, it just, it, until I, until the step process happened. And I have never gone, gotten back to that. I've never become that sensitive to where things would knock me over like that. Um, it's a it's a real you know it's a it's a real uh, disability. It really is for a lot of people. You're 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 talking my experience and exactly what I believe. I, I heard in one of the earlier meetings that I went to, you're going to get to a point where you don't care what other people think about you. And I thought that's impossible. <laughs> what do you mean that's impossible? Because I I was just crippled with shame when I thought that you, you, you thought I, I was a real jerk or whatever. Yeah. It, 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 and listen, Monty, it, it, I, today suicide is it, it, among teens and stuff is really, really spiking. And it has a lot to do with social media and it has a lot to do with being shamed by peers. Yeah. And, and, you know, us alcoholics are not the only ones that are, have dependency upon approval from others or esteem from others uh, but but a healthy a healthy emotional state is one where if we're okay inside we're way less concerned about what's happening outside yes you know what i mean absolutely absolutely and when you know and when i when i discovered this the first time i ever ever heard this letter read, I thought, that's it. That is exactly where I was. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. 
you know. Yeah, it's powerful. It's powerful. It, it, he he was so uh, so acute at at you know dissecting the 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 human condition. Bill Wilson. He yeah. Really, he really was. Yeah. What what incredible insight! But but he, but he had to experience it to understand it. He had to go all the way down to know yeah. what all the way up was about. Oh man! Wow. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Listen, listeners, if, if uh, I'd love to hear from you, we'd both love to hear from you. If if you have any thing that you identify here with this emotional sobriety versus emotional dependency thing, if 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 you've listened to this broadcast and you've had the yeah but habit going on, because I, I know <laughs> if I heard this at times, you know, in the past, I'd be going yeah but, you know, if that's you, email us, would you? Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Take 12 radio at comcast.net. Chris, thank you so much for another great broadcast. Oh, great. I'll see you next week, Monty. All right, my friend. All right, everybody. Uh, Are you emotionally dependent? Maybe (laughs) we'll see. All right. Until our next broadcast, this is the Monty man along with Chris S and we are wishing God's perfect serenity for you. For more recovery workshops with Chris S. and the Monty Man, visit our website at Take12Radio.com and click on the Recovery Workshops banner. This has been a broadcast of Take 12 Recovery Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. This has been a chicken and a pig production. Kitty, 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 kitty. Meow, meow, meow. Woof, woof.